Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rice, uh, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I too would like at the outset to acknowledge uh, the wrongs, uh, including wrongs to human rights of the indigenous people of our country, and I am proud to have served on the High Court of Australia, which in the Mabo case and cases that followed it, uh, took a, a strong and principled stand to correct those wrongs. Uh, and uh, it's uh, action of that kind that has motivated me in the work that I have been doing for North Korea, for the people of North Korea. Uh, I'm very glad that you've come here tonight to join in a reflection on the position of North Korea in respect of human rights. And these remarks of mine are going to be divided into three parts. Uh, and then we will have uh, some Q&A. The first part is uh, the chronicle of the work of the Commission of Inquiry, um, how it was set up, what its mandate was, how it went about its task, what it found, what it reported, and where the report stands at this moment. The second part uh, will be of particular interest to lawyers, but not only, I think, lawyers. It will concern the methodology of the Commission, because this Commission of Inquiry went about its task in a way that was quite different from other Commissions of Inquiry of the United Nations. And essentially, it went about the task uh, in the manner of the common law, because that was the manner uh, of inquiring and of conducting public hearings that I was familiar with. Uh, and I will suggest to you that that manner was particularly useful in gathering the testimony and in writing the report. And I believe that the report is actually a very readable document, which you can't say about most United Nations reports. And thirdly, uh, I'm going to address the issue of the um, follow-up to the report and where it stands at this moment uh, in the United Nations system because we are facing uh, coming months testing times for the uh, implementation of the recommendations and proposals that the Commission has put before the United Nations. The Commission of Inquiry arose, I believe, out of a general feeling of great unease with the situation of human rights in North Korea uh, on the part of the organs of the United Nations that are concerned with uh, human rights. In particular, the Human Rights Council, which is based in Geneva, it meets in a wonderful room uh, in the Palais des Nations. It is the room where formerly the, com the Commission on Human Rights used to meet but the Council uh, now um, has assumed those responsibilities and expanded them. Uh, and uh, it has a system called Universal Periodic Review. This is an innovation of the Council. The method of Universal Periodic Review is designed to subject all countries uh, to um, regular examination of their human rights record. And that means that the Russian Federation gets examined, the United States of America, the Permanent Five on the Security Council, and all the rest of us, including Australia, get examined for our human rights record with a number of criticisms and comments and suggestions for improvement. North Korea uh, was subjected to its first examination of its human rights about two years ago and uh, it remains the only country which has been examined under UPR, uh, which has refused to accept a single one of the recommendations. 187 recommendations were made for the improvement of serious human rights breaches in the country. Uh, and uh, because the uh, government uh, in uh, Pyongyang would not allow the uh, special rapporteur who had been appointed by the Human Rights Council to look specifically at human rights in 
uh, North Korea, would not allow him into the country. Um, that plus the response to the Universal Periodic Review, I think led the uh, Human Rights Council to the point where it considered that it had to ratchet up the uh, examination of human rights in North Korea and so uh, a commission of inquiry was created by decision of the Council. Uniquely, this is the only commission of inquiry of the United Nations that was created without a vote. Three times the President of the Council, Ambassador Herzl of Poland, paused to see if there was a call for a vote but call for a vote came there not. Uh, and that, um, uh, we thought, really armed the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea with a, a very uh, considerable strength because it indicated that there was virtual unanimity that the situation of human rights needed examination. Three members were appointed by Ambassador Herzl uh, in accordance with his mandate, to be the commissioners. Um, one was the special rapporteur, Marzuki Darasman, who had been refused entry and who had recommended that a commission of inquiry be created. Uh, Mr. Darasman had been the um, Attorney General of Indonesia. Uh, he's a very accomplished lawyer, uh, speaks perfect English, uh, is highly talented and a good cross-examiner and uh, with experience of trials and of practical law. Secondly, uh, Sonia Berserko was appointed. She uh, is a human rights expert and civil society uh, personality in Serbia. She's an expert in crimes against humanity and genocide, of which, sadly, her country has had quite a lot of experience. Uh, and uh, she was appointed the second member, and I was appointed the third, and I was designated to be the chair. Uh, the Commission first met in July 2013, and we were required by our mandate to report on nine headings which were identified by the Human Rights Council, and we were required to do that by March 2014. Because the report had to be translated into this, or rendered into the six languages of the United Nations, that effectively meant that we had to complete our task by uh, the end of 2013. And so, effectively, we had six months within which to produce this report. And we did so. Uh, the report was produced on time, within budget, and unanimously, uh, and it was then put into the system for the purpose of printing and uh, with the translations, and it was ultimately presented to the Human Rights Council uh, on the 17th of March 2014 uh, by the three commissioners uh, and was immediately the subject of a call for an ARIA briefing, which I will explain to you, uh, by the Security Council in New York. That itself was an unusual uh, but promising step that was taken in the Security Council. Um, now, the nine-point mandate covered the whole range of areas which had been the subject of report, complaint and concern to the United Nations. <clears throat> the issue of the detention centres. Uh, North Korea denies that there are detention centres, but uh, unfortunately for North Korea, we now have uh, Google Earth and international satellites which can examine uh, quite uh, directly and with great clarity um, the topography of every country on Earth and North Korea is not immune. And the testimony that was given about the detention centres was uh, corroborated uh, in terms of the description of the detention centres and their layout and their approximate size, uh, their proximity to identified cities, uh, and all of that confirmed that there are very large detention centres in North Korea. Those detention centres have, according to our estimates, between 
uh, 80,000 and 120,000 people uh, who are living in conditions of uh, great um, deprivation. Uh, there are books written on this subject uh, and there was testimony before us concerning the starvation conditions in the detention centres, but also the, uh, the bringing there not only of the person who's alleged or suspected hostility to the regime led to their arrest and detention, but also two generations usually of the same family so that the scourge can be removed from society. Uh, starvation is the order of the day in the detention centres. And some of the most powerful testimony we had concerned the diet, which uh, in many cases is reduced to living on grass, living off rodents. Uh, we asked for access to North Korea and to the detention centres, but as we expected would happen, access was denied. The testimony we received was extremely vivid as to the uh, severe and murderous conditions in the detention centres in North Korea. Um, a, a second mandate item concerned the restrictions on movement within the country. Um, citizens of North Korea cannot leave their hamlet, their village, without the permission of a local official. Uh, and that is a, a restriction on movement which is contrary to universal human rights. <coughs> uh, access to information is uh, not uh, in truth available in North Korea. Access to radio and television is effectively controlled in access to the government outlets and that's the source of information. Uh, possession, even possession of um, soap operas from South Korea in the Korean language, which of course is common to both parts of the peninsula, uh, is a serious offence. Uh, and uh, the reason for the objection of North Korea to the soap operas is, of course, because the soap operas reveal life in all of its variety in South Korea uh, and reveal the relative prosperity in which people uh, live their lives in uh, South Korea. And the backdrop of the soap operas is of the uh, motor cars, uh, consumer goods, the television sets, uh, the international holidays and all the other paraphernalia, the McDonald's stores uh, of a Western um, uh, and uh, prosperous economy. South Korea is now one of the ten most prosperous economies in the world and still growing. Uh, North Korea is an economic catastrophe and its system lacks the markets that can deliver the products uh, and the investment and the capital that are necessary for a modern state. That element of life in North Korea uh, gave rise to the next uh, matter we were commanded to investigate and that was food. In the mid-1990s, uh, North Korea uh, suffered an extremely serious um, famine. That was partly as a result of natural causes, but partly because of the uh, disorganisation of the markets. Uh, people could not get food. Uh, and even to this day, the supply of food in North Korea, although there has been some improvement in the natural conditions and some improvement in the uh, in the market uh, situation, the supply of food uh, is still um, problematic for some members of the community. Uh, for example, uh, the neonates in uh, North Korea, even on the figures that are supplied by North Korea to the World Health Organization and to the World Food Program, uh, disclose that newborn babies uh, are stunted to an extent of 27%. It was 34%, it's come down to 27%, but 27% is still a very high level of stunting, which means that the babies are malnourished, their mothers carrying them are malnourished. Uh, in their early weeks and months and years of life, they are malnourished. 
that means their brain is not expanding at that critical moment when our brains expand and that will lead to lifelong um, uh, burdens in health of that cohort of the population. Discrimination was another matter we were asked to investigate. Discrimination against women in North Korea is rife. Uh, discrimination against people on the grounds of religion uh, is widespread. Um, this was fully reported on in our report, but gained very little coverage in the international media, which is surprising to me because uh, it's, again, a very serious, um, potentially grave um, uh, imposition on the uh, human rights of the people of North Korea. At partition, uh, after the fall of Japan in 1945, um, the Christian identifying population of North Korea was the same as that of South Korea. They were about 25% uh, of the population were identifying as Christians. But uh, today, the, uh, on the figures supplied by North Korea, the Christian identifying population uh, of North Korea is 0.8%. Uh, that is to say it's less than 1%. And an important question arose for us, is that because the Christians had been, were being or had been or in significant numbers had been killed or is it simply because the regime is so hostile to religion uh, that people thought it a better and a wiser and more prudent step not to have anything to do with religion? Having in your possession Bibles or other religious paraphernalia uh, is a, a very serious offence in North Korea and many of those who had fled into China in search of refuge who were sent back into North Korea by China uh, have come with Christian uh, publications because the escape lines in China are often organised by Christian churches to help people escape to the Republic of Korea, which is South Korea. <coughs> Discrimination against people also exists on a, a caste-like system, a class system, which was put in place by the original Kim, the original uh, leader of North Korea, Kim Il-sung. Uh, he invented the so-called Songban system. Songban means classification in Korean. And the classification uh, in that country of people uh, goes to a, a degree of more than 50 subcategories, but essentially they are three. The uh, core class, who are the elite, uh, the wavering class, who are subdued but can't be trusted, that's most of the people, uh, and the hostile class, uh, who uh, are identified because of some connection with South Korea or because uh, of some suspicion has fallen on them and they are sent in to work in arduous conditions in the northeast of the country, often in mines. They get the worst jobs, they don't get education, they don't get housing, they can't live in Pyongyang uh, and they suffer many disadvantages. Uh, there was another category which concerned countries outside uh, North Korea and this was the category of abductions. North Korea had a policy of abducting people who it thought would be helpful to their economy. And so when the uh, Korean War was reaching its close and the South, the South Korean and United Nations forces were driving the uh, North Korean forces back into North Korea, they seized about 100,000 uh, citizens of South Korea, mostly young men, who were taken up, taken from their families, taken up into North Korea and have had no or virtually no contact with their families in South Korea ever since. And likewise, there was about 100,000 prisoners of war. The armistice which was signed at the end of the Korean War provided for the prisoners of war to be exchanged. Uh, North Korea uh, exchanged 7,000 uh, but did not give the full number that it had. Uh, and interestingly, 
because of the opening up of archives in the Russian Federation, which had been the archives of the Soviet Union, uh, there are records now of the conversations between Kim Il-sung and uh, Joseph Stalin concerning uh, the starting of the Korean War, which um, uh, upholds what the United Nations asserted at the time, that it started out of a North Korean invasion of the South and denies the North Korean assertion that it was a South Korean attack which was then repulsed. Uh, and the conversations between Stalin and uh, Kim Il-sung are all recorded uh, and available. Likewise, the keeping of large numbers of prisoners of war uh, is recorded in the Soviet archives and there's many other such uh, documents that are now available both from the, the Serb Soviet Union and also from the German Democratic Republic and the countries of the Eastern Bloc. Uh, their archives are also now available, often available online and you can go in and, and uh, find out all sorts of things that were taking place uh, during those years. So these were the matters we explored uh, and uh, we uh, decided to explore them by a methodology uh, that was distinctive. The methodology uh, could be sort of subtitled uh, Common Law Lawyer Meets the United Nations or maybe uh, more accurately the United Nations Meets the Common Law because the way the civil law countries, more countries are, this comes as a terrible shock to common lawyers, but more countries are civil law countries than common law countries. Uh, the civil law is a, a, it has, is a more efficient system of doing law. It, it's more low key, it doesn't have the public hearings and, and so on. Uh, and uh, it tends to have people who do their work in private and often in secret. Uh, that's not the way of the common law of England. From the very early days in medieval times, the English had this strange idea that procedure was the essence of good uh, legal work and that you had to do things in public because if you did it in public, you would then carry the village and the community with you that they could judge those who were doing the inquiry uh, and they could hear what was being said. It would spread around and people would become familiar with it uh, and it would raise expectations that there would be a proper outcome to it. Uh, if the English law and its procedures have a fault, it, it was that it's a much more expensive way of doing law, but also that sometimes they were more concerned with procedure than with what actually was the substance of the matter. Uh, but a lot of the public law that we have is based on courts that don't check whether the right decision was made, but check whether the right procedures were followed uh, because of the fact that there is this view that if you follow the right procedures, then you're likely to come out at the end with uh, right answers. So uh, what we did, we agreed, the three commissioners, that we would um, uh, have public hearings. Now there'd never been uh, public hearings. There was one attempt in one COI to do it, but it is not the way commissions of inquiry have operated in the past. Uh, and of course the Secretariat who were appointed to help us was very anxious about the security implications and about the, the question of whether it would be safe, whether the, the, the media should be allowed in and so on. And we said this is going to be transparent. We're going to have this open. If it is safe for the witnesses to give evidence in public, they will do so. If it's not safe, they'll, we'll see them in private. Uh, and so we advertised. We had no difficulty getting witnesses. We knew we wouldn't get into North Korea. And so we had to gather the witnesses of people who could say, tell us about the conditions in North Korea uh, with up-to-date testimony. Uh, there are 26,000 North Korean refugees living in South Korea. 26,000, that's a very big 
uh, section of their community. And we had a large, we had to cut off the number of witnesses because we just, uh, if we'd spent all our time seeing witnesses, we wouldn't have got our report written within this, the time we had. So by a, a certain point, we'd had public hearings in Seoul, in Tokyo, in London, where there is quite a large section of North Korean ex-military, uh, and in Washington, D.C., where there is a Korean-American uh, community, but also a lot of experts. Uh, there are people who spend their whole lives studying North Korea. There are libraries filled with material on North Korea. But what we wanted to do was to get this testimony uh, and to get it uh, in public, to get it before media, national and international, to get it before the world community, to get it recorded online, to get a transcript of it, to make the transcript available. And tonight when you go home, you can just Google North Korea Commission of Inquiry public hearings and you will see and you can judge for yourself uh, the reliability and accuracy of the people who gave testimony before us. Um, the witnesses gave their testimony in a way which um, was very low key. It reminded me of the testimony you see if you go to a Holocaust museum where b before they die, um, recordings have been made of people who went through the concentration camps in Germany. And it's amazing to see this. If you haven't see it, seen it, you should go to a, such a museum because people who are describing the most horrendous circumstances and the murders of their families and the seeing of a family member one second and then they're whisked away, um, they tell it in this very low-key, factual way. It's as if they have a mantra in their minds that they've got to get out of them to uh, justify their survival when so many others have perished. And so this is how these witnesses were. North Korea naturally said, and we were not surprised with this, that these were human scum. They were unreliable witnesses. They uh, were enemies of the people. They couldn't be believed. Uh, and that the Commission of Inquiry, by relying on them, had, uh, had relied on totally unreliable testimony. But... Um, some of them corroborated each other without knowing each other. Some of them were corroborated by objective material from the sources in North Korea, and some of them by objective material in the nature of satellite images uh, and uh, by expert testimony, which was available to us. And so this was the material on which we, we uh, prepared our report. Every word of the report was scrutinised by the commissioners and specifically by me. Part of the problem with United Nations reports is that they tend to be written by people whose first language is not the language in which they're written. And these people are brilliant uh, in comparison to Australians who are so monolingual. Um, they, their command of English is wonderful, amazing but it's just sometimes not quite comfortable. Uh, and you've got to have an Anglophone, a native English speaker, to make sure that the report is totally comfortable. Well, every word of that report has been analysed. All verbal amendments to the report uh, have been accepted. And every page of the report contains passages from the witnesses. And that's a very unusual thing. The discursive report is another common law feature. Uh, we write in a discursive way, uh, in a way that an intelligent lay person who has to be taken with the process uh, can understand. Uh, and uh, the quotes from the witnesses are a way of allowing the vividness of those who have suffered to be spoken directly to the United Nations and to the world community. And so that was the report we produced. Now, when it was delivered to the Human Rights Council in March 2014, uh, it created, I think it's fair to say, a sensation because 
there'd never been a commission of inquiry report of this kind. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I believe that that plus the international attention to the report was very beneficial in ensuring that it secured a lot of attention and debate uh, in the Human Rights Council. At the end of the debate, only six countries disassociated themselves from the report. Uh, those countries were China, the Russian Federation, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Vietnam and Pakistan. They were the countries that didn't agree with the report. But when analysed, their disagreement was not with uh, support for the human rights situation in North Korea. It wasn't in any criticism of particular findings which we had made. It was rather that they didn't agree with country-specific mandates. Now, that's a very formalistic uh, approach. Uh, as a person who's lived or my life in the law, I'm very familiar with formalism. Formalism uh, is saying, well, you've done this report, we can't criticise any of it, uh, but uh, we don't approve of you doing the report and therefore we're going to ignore what you've found. Uh, that is not, in my uh, opinion, consistent with the Charter. The Charter allows certain countries, five of them, to have a veto, but that is only in the Security Council. It doesn't give a veto to North Korea or everybody, anybody else uh, from having an investigation by the Human Rights Council, which was duly uh, decided and, as I've told you, without even a call for a vote. Uh, and then we received the call for the ARIA briefing. Now, Mr ARIA was a diplomat from Latin America uh, who concerned that the Security Council might be frustrated in getting matters of importance for peace and security before it, uh, devised a procedure for briefing members of the Security Council, and it's called the ARIA procedure. And the ARIA procedure uh, means that if a member of the Security Council asks for a briefing, uh, then the briefing can be organised uh, it doesn't take place in the beautiful chamber of the Security Council in New York. It takes place in a big chamber next door. And so an ARIA briefing was organised in the uh, big General Assembly chamber next to the Security Council. Uh, and that chamber was packed with countries of the General Assembly because this report was a matter of concern to the whole international community. In the front were the 15 seats for the Security Council members of the time being in a horseshoe type arrangement. Uh, and there were two seats which were empty. The seat of the People's Republic of China and the seat of the Russian Federation. Uh, but that meant 13 members seats were there and they were filled. Pressure had been applied, it came back to us, to countries, particularly African countries, not to turn up. But everyone turned up except the two permanent five members. And uh, of the 13, 11 spoke. And all of them spoke in favour of the report. Of the 11, nine specifically endorsed one of the key recommendations in the report, which was that the uh, case of North Korea should exceptionally be referred by the Security Council to the International Criminal Court. Uh, and uh, that means the majority of the, of the Security Council members were in favour of that proposal. Now, what is happening now and what is going to happen? The uh, report is now proceeding from the Human Rights Council to the General Assembly. That's the body of the United Nations to whom the Human Rights Council reports. It will probably come before the General Assembly in uh, September of this year and a motion will be prepared to respond to it. Uh, the Commission of Inquiry recommended that the General Assembly should refer the report into the Security Council for formal consideration. 
formal consideration of what we've recommended and specifically formal consideration of the recommendation to uh, transmit uh, the case of North Korea to a prosecutor, the prosecutor's office in the International Criminal Court. We found in the, in the headings which we investigated, uh, crimes against humanity had been committed. These are very grave international crimes. Uh, we did not find that genocide had been committed in North Korea. And there's a reason for that. The Genocide Convention of the United Nations, formulated in 1948, uh, defines genocide as being the killing or violence against a population or part of a population as a matter of state policy uh, on the grounds of race, ethnicity, nationality or religion. And in the case of North Korea, the uh, crimes against humanity which we have found um, are not on the basis of race or religion. They are on the basis of political affiliation or deemed political objection. Uh, views were expressed to us that genocide has expanded in its meaning since 1948 and now includes uh, the uh, violent acts on the basis of political or social beliefs. Um, a, 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 a reasonable case can be made out in support of that view, but we had so many crimes against humanity that we thought the correct stance of the Commission of Inquiry was to take uh, a modest view and therefore we didn't find genocide, uh, crimes against humanity are already extremely serious international crimes and there's plenty of evidence of those. When we came to a point, either factual or legal, where we were in doubt as to whether the case had been made out, we always opted for uh, modesty and didn't push the envelope. This is a hard-hitting and uh, and discreet uh, and I believe convincing and readable report which is now before the international community. Some people have said to me, uh, couldn't you see those empty seats in the ARIA briefing? Can't you see what is going to happen when this matter goes to the Security Council? Uh, don't you think it might have been more prudent not to uh, uh, be so uh, uh, assertive about the findings. Could you not have reached out more to find some agreeable solution with North Korea? Well, the answer to that is the world has been trying to reach out to North Korea for a very long time uh, and North Korea will not respond. North Korea has been brilliant in its diplomacy uh, of closing its borders of keeping out scrutiny, of refusing even tourists to talk with their population. You can go there on so-called tours, but you are controlled. And if you try to get away from your minders, uh, on some occasions, the tourists who've done that have been shot. And on other occasions, they've been rounded up and brought back into control. Uh, North Korea is a totalitarian state. It's not just autocratic. It's a state that seeks to impose upon its people uh, what they must think. It tries to invade their brains as well as their action. It tries to get into their loyalties uh, and even minuscule uh, disrespect to the Kim family can lead to extremely grave consequences. Uh, and therefore, in a few weeks, we're going to face the crunch time for human rights in North Korea. And um, in response to the suggestion, well, nothing's going to happen because the two P5 members are going to be against any action. Uh, in response to that, I think uh, that can't be absolutely sure. In the case of the Russian Federation, they had a lot of connections with North Korea during the Soviet time. But since the end of the Soviet regime, they have not given aid to uh, North Korea, which used to prop up the regime in North Korea. 
Uh, and they have very little trade with North Korea, and they've got lots of other matters on their plate at the moment which are occupying their attention. So it's not at all certain that the Russian Federation uh, would uh, take uh, the serious step of preventing the Security Council from acting in a strong way against uh, North Korea, as the report suggests. As to China, China certainly has a uh, very substantial trade with North Korea. It now is the main backer of North Korea. Uh, it uh, has geopolitical reasons uh, for wanting to have, if possible, a buffer state. But North Korea has the fourth largest standing army in the world. North Korea has reportedly 20 nuclear warheads. North Korea is developing a missile system which can deliver its warheads uh, not only within its own country but also to South Korea, which is immediately abutting, uh, into China itself, into Japan and into, uh, if not now, very shortly, the west coast of the United States of America. So North Korea is a very dangerous country and it's also a violent country. Uh, the murder of Kim, uh, of uh, uh, Jang Song Tek, the uncle of the Supreme Leader, last December, the second or third most powerful man in the land, um, arrested in the Politburo, dragged out under the television lights, uh, put before a military tribunal, put on trial, with, according to the Korean, North Korean news agency, the judges screaming at him uh, that he was uh, lower than a dog, uh, convicting him and then executing him by firing squad all within four days is um, uh, an unusual way to solve a political issue. Uh, as we can understand it, Jiang's error was he was urging that North Korea should go the China path. Uh, and he had uh, a lot of dialogue in and with China. And so uh, I, I suggest that it's not at all certain what China will do. Uh, in the time that China has had the, the, uh, the People's Republic has had the China seat in the United Nations, uh, it has used the veto in the Security Council ten times. That contrasts with the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation, uh, which have used it 350 times, uh, the United States of America 250 times, the United Kingdom and France uh, about 100 times, France 78 times, and China 10. Uh, the veto is not generally the way China does international law and international policy. And therefore, uh, what is really needed is the kind of leadership and action that we saw uh, in respect of MH17, because that was a very serious matter which affected very closely uh, the Russian um, uh, view of the world and its, its uh, borderlands and those uh, people of Russian ethnicity who are close to it. Uh, and yet, um, thanks in part to leadership on the part of Australia, as uh, by chance a Security Council member, uh, and uh, the United States uh, and other uh, members of the Security Council, uh, a resolution was found and that resolution uh, opened the way towards the investigation that will now take place. What we need now in the case of North Korea is a second endeavour of this kind. And I'm far from saying that the uh, international community will fail in this endeavour. This is going to be a very important test for the United Nations and its machinery. And in that test so far, I have to say to you, and I report to you as Australian citizens, the United Nations has done everything it should have done. It set up a completely independent commission. Uh, it gave that commission an excellent secretariat of devoted and hardworking and independent uh, officers. Uh, it delivered a report within time, very efficiently. The report is readable. 
the report collects uh, very serious crimes against humanity. They have been delivered to the Human Rights Council. It has sent them with a strong endorsement to the General Assembly and now the question will be what does the General Assembly do and what does the Security Council do? But in every way, the Charter of the United Nations has worked as it is expected to work and the question will now be what will happen uh, next and for that all I can say is watch this space. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> we have about a quarter of an hour or so for questions and uh, perhaps a little longer. So I'd ask uh, you, you don't have to mention your name if you don't want to, uh, to um, uh, speak into the microphone and then I'll endeavour to answer the question. They can be questions or comments. You don't have to agree with anything I've said. Uh, you're not going to be dragged out of here under Klieg lights and uh, <laughs> nasty things happen to you and you can uh, disagree. That's the nature of a democracy. Anybody have any questions or comments? Could somebody ask the sound technician to turn up the microphones, please? What motivates... What, what might motivate China in making its decision on the Security Council? Is it more likely to be motivated not by its view of the substance of this issue, but rather by concern that on another occasion Well, I can't, of course, comment on the psychology of China or what might motivate China. Uh, China uh, is criticised in the Commission of Inquiry report because uh, a large number of people who fled into China were returned under a memorandum of agreement between North Korea and China that provided for them to be uh, sent back into uh, North Korea. China is a party to the Refugee Convention and Protocol uh, and therefore it's bound by the obligations of the Refugees Convention. Uh, China asserts that the people who came into uh, China from North Korea are economic refugees uh, and that it doesn't owe them the protection uh, of uh, the Convention in the case of well-founded fear of persecution if they're returned, even though there is an ample evidence, uh, including now in the Commission of Inquiry report, that one could have a well-founded fear of persecution for a convention reason. China does not really cooperate with the High Commissioner for Refugees. So China's concerns uh, could relate to criticism of itself. On the other hand, China itself, uh, according to what one reads, uh, in China media, including in blogs, which are now increasingly uh, freer in China, where uh, Chinese uh, citizens are saying, why are we supporting this uh, terrible regime? Why, why should we, uh, China? And that's the point. China has itself come a long way, uh, and uh, it's come a long way, including in greater openness about human rights issues. And therefore, the question will be, does China uh, really want to have uh, a, a, a semi-violent and dangerous country on its borders with 20 nuclear warheads and ongoing serious crimes against humanity, which themselves can cause uh, international uh, political repercussions? Uh, but how this will work out in the 
um, symbiosis of the Security Council is the question. Uh, and that is something which I think it's premature to assess. Uh, uh, one hopes that China will act with the responsibility that is expected of one of the P5 uh, members of the Security Council. Uh, and that certainly has been their practice up till now. They do not use the veto often. And therefore, uh, we shouldn't assume that China will uh, do otherwise than to uh, take its responsibilities in the Security Council seriously. The interrelationship of uh, universal human rights and international peace and security is signalled in the Charter itself. And it's also reflected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in many of the treaties, uh, many of which China and DPRK, North Korea, have signed. So uh, it will be an important question uh, to be addressed. And uh, I hope that China will respond uh, with the responsibility of such an important country, such a leading country. In Geneva, the Chinese mission was always most correct and courteous in its dealings with the Commission of Inquiry, but uh, in the end, they would not allow us access to China. They would not allow our request to go to Beijing to speak with their state officials and would not allow us to go to the border areas to look at the areas where uh, Korean national refugees are. So uh, it is a sensitive question uh, in China, but um, what we have to hope is that um, the interaction of our, our, our own excellent diplomats in the United Nations will produce an outcome, uh, as happened in MH17, which uh, will be uh, one which is protective of fundamental values and human rights. People what? The people who gave testimony. Yes. Uh, what was their psychology or what was their, their opinion of the regime and, and the broader opinion of the young? Yes. The Did, and is there a chance that one day they may revolt against the regime? Well, um, first of all, it was no part of the work of the Commission of Inquiry to stimulate or suggest or require a revolt. Uh, the decision on the um, uh, governance of North Korea is a matter for the people of North Korea, uh, and uh, DPRK constantly says that the human rights measures of the United Nations are designed to overthrow the regime. They are a member state of the United Nations. We had to accept them as a member state of the United Nations, and we did so, but said, if you're a member state, you have to comply with the fundamental principles of universal human rights, and you're not doing that. You've got to bring yourself into conformity. Now, your question was an interesting one, because one of the features of the testimony was, on the part of a number of the witnesses, that they would say that they loved Kim Il-sung. These are people from North Korea who have fled North Korea. Uh, they would say he was a great leader and we love him, uh, but um, everything went downhill uh, when uh, Kim Jong-il took over and, uh, and so today. Uh, that was interesting because you would expect if they were human scum who were just opposed to the regime, they would come along and and, and uh, tread a party line and, and criticise everything about North Korea, but they didn't. Uh, not all of them did. Some did, but not all of them did. And uh, I think that was one of the indicia that these were people who were sincerely trying to tell things as they saw it. And that was interesting that a number of them had this reaction. 
but if you live in a totalitarian system uh, where all you get is the worship of the Kim family and that that is part of the received um, uh, wisdom of the society, that every home has to have two portraits uh, of uh, Kim Il-sung and the current uh, leader and they have to be kept clean and must never be damaged and so on, then it's not all that surprising that they get into their minds uh, a sort of infatuation and love and respect of which some of these witnesses gave evidence. And another question. Yes. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question was regarding uh, international aid uh, to try and improve the human rights situation in North Korea. Given the fact that the North Korean regime is known for systematic perversion of any aid to the military and regime, how would you say that any international efforts to improve the humanitarian situation in North Korea will be effective? Well, this was one of the shocking features of the famine, that North Korea, in the midst of this terrible, partly natural, partly man-made uh, catastrophe, um, was spending huge amounts of, uh, of uh, capital on uh, acquiring nuclear weapons and missile systems and supporting the fourth largest standing army in the world. North Korea has a population almost exactly the same as Australia, uh, but it has an army, uh, people under arms, uh, more than a million people, and uh, it's an extremely um, well-armed um, society. So uh, they were spending their money on this rather than on feeding the population. But that notwithstanding, at the time of the famine, the international community um, came good with um, lots of food aid. North Korea, when uh, the, the bags of flour would arrive with the United States flag on it, uh, uh, spread the word that this is reparations for the wrongs done to North Korea because the United uh, States had been humiliated and this was their reparation. Uh, but in fact it was food aid which was granted uh, and a lot of Western countries, including the Republic of Korea, uh, gave generously food aid. The problem was North Korea would not conform to the protocols for the monitoring of the food aid and one of the real concerns of the international community was that the food was going to the core class and not to the hostile uh, or the wavering class and not to some areas uh, of Korea, uh, North Korea, where there are significant numbers of the hostile class up in the north uh, east of the country. And therefore, ultimately, uh, international donors, both um, United Nations and private, um, uh, began to withdraw food aid because they couldn't be sure what was happening to it. Uh, and this was the problem of getting the food out. And humanitarian aid is something that should not be disturbed. The report of the Commission of Inquiry was strongly affirmative of the right of the people of North Korea who have suffered a lot, suffered enormously, uh, not to be further punished. But um, notwithstanding that, some efforts have to be made to monitor aid and also to uh, monitor the moves towards human rights respect. But North Korea will not engage. North Korea will not accept a single one of the 187 recommendations that the Human Rights Council has put up. And you say, well, we, we should reach out and engage. How do you do that to a country that doesn't permit its, any of its citizens to have access to the internet? The only people who have access to the internet in North Korea, the only people who can read the report of the Commission of Inquiry in North Korea, are the elite. Uh, the ordinary citizens can't see our public hearings, can't see our report, can't access the transcript, doesn't know what the uh, body set up by the United Nations says about their country. We offered to go there and answer questions. We offered to present our report. Uh, and that was ignored. Um, North Korea does not engage. And 
it's following a strategy which so far has been um, brilliant and has been rewarded with great success. The world not knowing looks to other things and that's what the Commission of Inquiry is seeking to uh, undo.